Greetings, and welcome to tonight's CF Discovery Series and CFRI Live. I am David Suhu, Director of Programs and Operations for Cystic Fibrosis Research Incorporated, and I am very pleased to be here with you tonight. Tonight, we will be looking forward to a presentation and update on the Affordable Care Act, presented by Sherry Sager, who is the Chief Government and Community Relations Officer at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford. The CF Discover Series was designed to make vital <coughs> information, such as what you will hear tonight from Ms. Sager, accessible to the CF community by presenting various speakers that are experts in their field. We are very grateful to Carol Jenkins, CFRI's retired executive director, and Camille Wasserwich, nurse practitioner at the Stanford CF Adult Clinic for their working together on creating our groundbreaking live streaming CF resource program. Thanks to both of them for their innovative energies. Thanks also to Genentech, Cornerstone Therapeutics, and Modern Health Pharmacy for sponsoring this important evening. Their support covers the cost of this lovely venue, the refreshments, and other program expenses. Before beginning, I would like to note that no information presented tonight is intended for patients, diagnosis, or treatment. As always, we urge you to work together with your healthcare team for your medical treatment. Tonight's program, live from Crown Plaza Cabana in Palo Alto, is being produced by your CFRI Live team Scott Wakefield plus Mary Convento, who is tracking questions from our online community. I encourage you to ask questions, whether you are here in the audience or part of the online community. To those of you who are unable to join us in person, tonight we are, <clears throat> we are also glad that you can join us through CFRI Live. If you would like to ask any questions, you will need to register on <clears throat> ustream.tv. So let's get started. I'm delighted to welcome Sherry Sager. She is the Chief Government and Co Community Relations Officer for Lucille Packard Children's Hospital in Palo Alto. As the Chief Government Relations Officer, she is responsible for developing and advocating positions in legislation and public policies that impact Lucille Packard Children's Hospital and the children it serves. An advocate <coughs> and leader in public arena for over 30 years, she is widely recognized for her political acumen and understanding of public health care policy. Ms. Sager also has also worked as staff for elected officials on all levels of government, managed political campaigns, and volunteered on a city and county uh, task force and commissions. In 2006, Sherry led the successful effort <coughs> in the legislature with CFRI to add two disorders cystic fibrosis and biotinities, deficiency to the state newborn screening program, which was included as part of the 2006 and 2007 budget, trailer bill signed, by, <coughs> signed into law by the then governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. Sherry has a BS in uh, political science from Santa Clara University and an MPA from San Jose State University. So please help us welcome Sherry Sager to the podium. David, thank you, um, and thanks to those that are here live and those that um, are going to see this um, live on on computer. I have to admit, this is the first time I've done a uh, streaming uh, presentation, so I hope I uh, make sense streaming as well as in person. Um, when David had asked me to do this a while ago, we talked about it being an update in terms of the Affordable Care Act from what I had done last August at the annual conference. And then with everything else going on, we added in CCS and a teeny bit on GHPP. So what I thought I would do this evening is spend a little bit of time on the Affordable Care Act because there's not a whole lot new since August. There will be, but we're not there yet. But there's a whole lot going on in the CCS world that I think we still have an opportunity to affect some changes. And so I think it's important to spend a little bit of time there. And part of that is to learn from what's happened with the GHPP program and see if at the same time we can then come up with some better 
solutions to be able to solve some of the issues that have r arisen uh, lately with GHPP. So to start with, I wanted to just sort of touch in terms of the Affordable Care Act because this is what's getting a lot of press and this is also what will allow us at some point to make the kinds of changes that are necessary in any piece of legislation that is as comprehensive as health care reform and the Affordable Care Act is. And so this is not to be taken as a comment that the law is bad. It's a comment that is realistic that says, no matter how hard you try, no matter how bright you are, you can't think of everything. And sometimes we don't know what needs to be fixed until we roll it out and start implementing it and say, oops, that didn't quite work the way we thought it would. And we're now starting to be at that point where it's time to look at how can we tweak it. So we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk about the enrollment numbers because that will uh, make an impact. What types of plans are out there? Um, which are the health plans that are really actively engaged in the Affordable Care Act? And what could this possibly mean for you? So the health exchanges, after a slow start, um, actually started taking off the beginning of 2014. Most states have had decided that they couldn't get their health exchange up and operating in time to make the October 1 launch. And so they've opted with going with a federal exchange. Part of the problem there, which has been well um, publicized, is that all of a sudden the federal government had a lot more uh, territory to cover than they had thought they would and their computerized system and their, their technology wasn't quite up to handling it. We spent two years in California putting our health exchange together. The feds tried to do that in significantly less time. But they finally did get the, the bugs worked out. March 31st was the deadline for this first year. There is a, a, an extension to April 15th for those folks in the national and, and some states who have opted for, if people were in the queue, that they started the enrollment process but hadn't had a chance to complete it, they have until April 15th. As of the beginning of the month, about 15% of the eligible population had enrolled. And by the time all the final numbers come out the end of April, it'll likely be more than 20% based on the surge that came in the last month. Nationally, more than 7 million people signed up for health care, which was the federal government's goal. One of the questions that's being asked is, how many of those 7 million were people that had been uninsured for some period of time versus people who have lost their health insurance in the last year because their employers made changes based on the Affordable Care Act, and we don't know that yet. Um, the information I've been reading um, says that, it, it, that the newly ins insured, the folks that had been previously uninsured, were the majority, but we don't know quite what that, that breakdown is. In California, their goal was to have 1 million people enroll and 1.2 enrolled. Nationally, um, the other piece of this I want to add is that we also allowed for a Medicaid expansion. Many states opted after the Supreme Court decision to not expand their Medicaid program. Nonetheless, more than 3 million um, new patients were added to the Medicaid rolls and 80% of them were located in just 10 states. Actually, I could tell you 50% of them were located in one state, in California. So California picked up a million and a half new Medicaid <coughs> enrollees. They were one of the states that chose to expand eligibility. And then I decided I wanted to see, so how is this breakdown? Are we really getting at the chronically uninsured, the low income folks that are eligible for some assistance? And we are. Um, the majority of people who have enrolled have enrolled with some kind of a subsidy. And if they have a subsidy, um, I'm going to sort of work around the numbers. If they had a subsidy, 67% of them picked the silver plan, which is really sort of the middle of the road. Only 4% opted for a platinum plan. 24% was the, really the entry level plan. 
and then 5% at the gold. The difference in these levels is the difference in the amount that they need to pay. The subsidy stays the same, it's what they need to pay out of pocket. And some of the differences is they have uh, more coverage under platinum, for example, but it costs them a lot more. And so I would guess that some of those folks that opted for platinum, even with subsidies, are uh, individuals and families that may have a chronic health care condition and know that they're going to need more services and that when it penciled out, it was actually cheaper for them to pay more in terms of premium costs to get more coverage down the road. For those folks who did not need subsidies, the platinum number actually tripled to 15%, silver dropped to 30, bronze 35, and gold 13. So people really were looking at what were, the, what were the plans that could provide them with the services and the coverage they needed? And I just put this up here because I wanted to look at, well, who are the health plans? Because there's a, a lot of health plans. And in California, the three major health plans are Blue Cross, Blue Shield, and Kaiser. They got the bulk of the um, enrollees. In, there's a scattering of small plans. So in areas where HealthNet might be there, there's, some, there's HealthNet enrollees. In Santa Clara County, there's a county plan called the Valley Health Plan. That picked up a, a, you know, several hundred enrollees. Other regions have their own health plan. But by and large, the three big health plans in the state picked up the bulk of the new enrollees. What this means to you, I think what it means is that there's a greater likelihood um, of be being able to access commercial insurance and not um, having to resort to emergency rooms and being uninsured. Theoretically, it should give you a choice of providers, a greater choice of providers, but realistically, we know that that's one of the areas that still needs work. That um, that w a lot of folks who thought they'd be able to continue with their existing providers have found that their existing providers did not sign up to be a provider under the health exchange. So even though the government was willing to have them continue as providers, they have chosen not to for various reasons. Um, and some um, have, have definitely to do with, with the reimbursement rates. But that's one of those things that both the federal government and the state government is well aware of and is looking to improve in, in future years. One of the hopes was that this would also bring some potential new providers, providers that hadn't historically been willing to accept Medi-Cal in California or Medicaid elsewhere, that they would now be willing to accept this new product and see some new services. That's some of the good news. The piece that I still worry about is I always worry that we'll get into a situation of what I call the any willing provider. And that is a provider says, okay, I'll, I'll you know, be part of the health exchange and I'll take any patients that sign up for, you know, for me and, and, but they might not have the expertise that we need for a chronic condition. Um, and especially as we look at children transitioning to adulthood. And we're probably actually better off with cystic fibrosis than we are with a lot of other um, diagnoses because the good news is that we've made so much, um, so many inroads over the last number of years, thanks to organizations like CFRI in terms of research that we're extending life expectancy. And so the adult world has had to learn how to care for patients with cystic fibrosis. We have a number of other diagnoses that the, the treatments and the improvements have only come along in the last 15 or 20 years, and the adult world doesn't know how to handle them yet. Things like congenital heart defects, some of the pediatric and childhood cancers. And so it's, as these kids age out of pediatric programs, how are we going to get them into appropriate care on the adult level? And I'm gonna guess, and you know this better than I do, that there are probably parts, not only of this state, but of this country, where we don't have a sufficient supply 
of adult CF experts um, in the physician world. And so we need to continue to work on how do we provide that training and that specialty so that as we make the, the findings and the treatment and the cures that allow folks to live longer, that we are able to provide them a continuous uh, uh, span of care. And I'm especially proud of what we did together, it's hard to believe it's been eight years, um, on adding cystic fibrosis and uh, biotinidase to the newborn screening panel. That's the good news, but the, again, the worrisome news is now we're gonna have a lot of kids as adults with chronic um, health conditions and we need to make sure we have sufficient providers to be able to care for them. So I'm gonna switch over for a moment to CCS and then I'll come back to GHPP. Um, what does the future hold? I mean, if you talk to anyone involved in the CCS system right now, whether they're a patient, a provider, um, an administrator, a medical director, everybody's worried, and, and I'd probably underline worried about five times. For the last 20 years, we have been successful at carving out the CCS program from Medi-Cal managed care in California to say that these are children with diagnoses that are um, can either you know catastrophic, chronic, lifelong, and they need specialized care that doesn't really fit in well with the managed care system. But we think, you know, since the state believes that managed care is the way of the future, we're all willing to, to look at that. And so the state has authorized pilots since 1994 to see how would we care for children in a Medi-Cal managed care type system. Um, but the state hasn't done a very good job then of funding the pilots, so the pilots haven't gotten off the ground. Um, and so every five years, the carve out has been extended for another five years. And language put in again about doing pilots. The last time this occurred was in, I have to do my, my subtraction in my head, in 2011 with the pilots to end, the carve out to end December 31st, 2015, and on January 1st, 2016, CCS and children served by CCS would roll into Medi-Cal managed care plans. And again, they put in their language about pilots. The state actually went so far as to do a, a pretty vigorous session on bringing technical experts, bringing families, um, looking at different options for pilots, different you know, things that could be studied. Numerous organizations submitted pilot proposals. The state selected five, um, one in, in San Mateo with the Health Plan of San Mateo, one in Alameda County, one in Los Angeles, one in Orange County, and one in San Diego. Each of those had at least one, if not two or three children's hospitals involved, other experts, the local Medi-Cal managed care plan, and they were all looking at slightly different models, which actually makes sense. Let's look at different models, see how, do an evaluation, see if any of these work, and if they do, which ones work best for children with, with a chronic health care condition. Um, San Diego decided to really focus it on a chronic care condition, and so they did their pilot, they wanted to do their pilot around one condition, or it was one or two conditions. San Mateo said, well, we already have a partial carbid, so we want to look at how can we do better case management and care coordination. Um, Alameda County said, well, we've got two children's hospitals that serve Alameda County primarily. We want to do an enhanced case management system. LA did a hybrid. They said, let us take 5,000 lives out of the 100,000 lives in Los Angeles County and do a special pro program just for them. Orange County said, well, let us create a brand new health plan for children with CCS eligible conditions separate from um, Cal Optima, which was their Medi-Cal managed care plan. Four years later, the state has actually only implemented one of those programs, the one in San Mateo County, which was the easiest to implement because it was the one that was gonna do the least change and they were already partially carved in. The other pilots have been trying 
to move forward. They haven't been able to get the claims data and the other information that they need to be able to finalize um, things in terms of negotiations for rates. So a couple of months ago, we all started, and we all being people in the, the children's hospitals and the CCS world, parents, hearing some rumblings that maybe, you know, there clearly wasn't time to do evaluation, so maybe the state was just going to roll these kids into Medi-Cal managed care on January 1, 2016, and maybe they would do it now. And everybody said, whoa, 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 wait, 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 time out. They have the experience of when Healthy Families was rolled into Medi-Cal managed care last year and a number of children lost services. They had the experience of when GHPP was rolled in and a number of patients couldn't get their factor anymore. And now we, we, they're disenrolling on a case-by-case -case basis. The state is also trying to um, roll in the dual eligibles. Um, they've rolled in the seniors and persons with disabilities. And if you talk to a lot of folks in the state, they think that that's worked really well. And if you talk to people in the community, they say maybe not so well. You know, there's still some issues that need to be worked out. Um, folks are still not getting to go to their preferred provider or the provider who actually knows them. And one of the, the worries that actually keeps me up at night is, as you know, you develop a relationship with your team of specialists and your caregivers, and you depend on them. And if all of a sudden you're assigned to a new primary care provider in a Medi-Cal managed care plan who may not have ever seen a patient with CF, or maybe they've got just two or three, but the vast majority of their practice um, are patients, children, or adults without a chronic condition, do they know where the resources are? The local initiatives, the health plans themselves, the Medi-Cal managed care plans, again, they've been so used to having these children carved out that they're looking at us and going, what if we have a really expensive patient? That could bust the bank and we don't know how. So th there, there are a lot of questions. But we've also heard that the state, that there is no way, no how, that the state will extend the carve out. Um, we have had conversations with both the Department of Healthcare Services, with legislators, and legislators will say, well, we made some of the changes we made to dual eligibles, to GHPP, to healthy families, <coughs> because of the state's budget crisis. And while we're not sitting pretty right now, we don't have the same crisis, so there's not that sense of urgency. And so if we're going to do this, we actually want to be sure that this is the right thing we're doing because they understand that, that our patients on CCS can oftentimes be the most vulnerable and the most fragile of our patients and our population. And so the legislature's kind of going, mm -hmm. so we feel like if we needed to, we could get the legislature to possibly extend the carve out. But the state has said, the governor, the administration, that's not going to happen. So it's like, well, it doesn't do us any good to get the legislature to do it if the governor vetoes us, vetoes it. So maybe we need to come up with an alternative plan. And so some of the alternatives that there are groups working on are maybe we should be looking at the whole child. We've talked about it. That's one of the rationales the state uses for folding CCS into Medi-Cal managed care because then the Medi-Cal managed care plan would care for the whole child, and so their, you know, their immunizations and their primary checks could be done through that same plan, and the, the child wouldn't be split between multiple plans. So maybe we look at an alternative plan that cares for the whole child, um, both you know, their, their normal, healthy development as well as their chronic condition. What are the criteria and standards? One of the things that a lot of us like about the CCS program is that they have criteria, that the physicians and the providers 
caring for patients actually have board expertise in the area with pediatrics, that this is what they do, they are the experts. That the facilities that they go to, the hospitals, have expertise in these areas. That they have not only the, the physicians, but they have the ancillary providers, the social workers, the nutritionists, the nurses, that also have the expertise. So what are the criteria and standards that CCS has put into place over the years that really work, that we want to maintain? Maybe we need to look at this on a regional basis. Medi-Cal managed care is done county by county. Well, that probably works for an adult population county by county, and especially if you're a mostly healthy population, because you're probably not you know, crossing county lines to get health care. For the patients that we serve, for your families, you're, you might live in one county, but the best provider for your care is in another county. So we need to make these regional to look at what works best for families and patients, which means going beyond county borders, which is a different way to look at a managed care system. And then there's sort of the fallback. If we don't do anything, it'll be folded into Medi-Cal managed care. So one of the things we've talked about is if we just come to the state and say, we're, we're working on a plan, give us more time, probably won't happen. So there are lots of organizations that are getting together and saying, let's work on this together, let's develop a plan, let's look at these alternatives, what data do we need to be able to make our case, we need to develop how these alternative plans would work, how it would work for families. Families need to be an integral part of making this work. And then once we do that, we lay it out, we need to do the actuarial numbers just like the state does and figure out what the cost is. We need to get from the state claims data so we could actually have real numbers to look at. And then we can go back to the state and say, okay, we're recommending, and this part I'm making up because we don't know what we're recommending, but we're recommending that there be um, three different plans in three different regions of the state. This is what we think it will cost. These are the services that we'll provide. These are the standards of care. These are the criteria. Give us three years now to actually operate this plan so we can see what works, what doesn't work, what we can tweak and not tweak. We can examine this. Let us do um, a real evaluation of does this work or doesn't it work? Were we better off actually with a state-run program like CCS that set care and standards and expertise? Or can we work in, a, in a, what I would call a modified Medi-Cal managed care plan? And here would be how it would work. And then at that point say, okay, so we need three years. So extend the program for three years. Let us actually put these things into place. See if they work. If they do, then you can look at doing this, implementing this long term. And if they don't, we can go back to the drawing board as opposed to on an artificial date of January 1, 2016, telling all of the children and families who are covered by CCS that now you're going to be part of your local Medi-Cal managed care plan, which we think will cause um, incredible disruption to families, to lives, but more importantly, to care. And um, at least I'm personally not willing to put children's lives at risk um, for something we don't know whether or not it will work. But if we're going to do this, we need to do this all together. And we need to all be working on parallel paths. If each of us are working on our own plan and, and something else, we're not going to be successful. And the state will come back and say, we gave you time to do something. You didn't do it, so we're just going to go back to our de facto. The state didn't realize when they did, when they rolled over GHPP as part of seniors and persons with disabilities, what that impact would be. They just said, oh, these are adults. They are a person with a disability. It, it should be able to roll over fine. Um, and they were taken by surprise when families came up and patients came and said, this isn't working. I can't get my medication. I can't get my factor. How do, you know, without this, you know, and so 
they immediately helped um, a number of families um, disenroll, but then th that word got out that they were allowing families to disenroll, so then they went, mm, oops, wait, 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 we can't have that. So now they've slowed that process down, and so we're having to go through appeals processes. Um, and so what I would say there, if that's a problem you're having, call your local legislator. Get them um, to go to bat for you. That's part of their job. Their staff will do it. They, they understand it. And if they don't hear that there's a problem there, they won't know it. All they will have to work from is the information that they get from the state at budget hearings. But if you as a family go in and call your local person and said, you know, my child, I have GHPP. I'm not being in this new plan. It's limited my access to the providers who know how to care for me, have limited the access to the medication that saves my life. Um, I've been trying to disenroll and go back to the fee-for-service. I need help. I can guarantee they will help you. And then they will have that information as they look at the budget. It's part of, of advocacy, but it's part of how we, we make changes. Um, and that's the place we are with all of these programs, with affordable care. We've rolled them out. We hope they're going to work the way we want them to, but we won't know until we actually start implementing them. Um, and and I, I, wish, I wish they would all work smooth. I mean, but I'm, I'm also realistic enough to know that that probably won't occur immediately. And so we have to tweak it. We need to find out. And we need to figure out whether it's a systemic issue that we need to go back and change or whether it's an outlier that the issue that this you know, particular family patient has is so unique to them that if we change it to fit them, it might create problems elsewhere. So is there something else we could do for this family that will fix it for them without changing the whole system? So we need to see which are individual fixes versus which need to be systemic fixes and tweaks that can help everyone. But again, the legislators aren't going to know about it if we don't tell them. And we need to tell them in a respectful way. Um, and, and I don't want to sound preachy or anything, but you know how you feel if somebody comes in and says, you guys blew it, this isn't working, you need to fix it, and then you sort of walk out, they're going to get defensive. But if instead you come in and say, we're trying to make this work, we have these problems, can we work with you to fix it so it works? They will be much more likely to want to work with, with you, with us, with all of us, to fix it and to make it work. So, and I know, I know how frustrating it gets when you're trying to work at the healthcare system. Um, my staff and I often have that, that same conversation when when even one of us or one of our loved ones is going through the healthcare system and we shake our, our heads and say, oh my gosh, we know the healthcare system and we're having this problem and we know who to call and talk to. How, you know, how are others managing it? So we're trying to see if we can't develop ways so that we can, again, help to improve that. How do we make it simpler? Um, unfortunately, and not, f not for all of you, but unfortunately for the vast majority of people, they don't think about health care and how it operates and how it works until they actually need it, um, as opposed to thinking about it ahead of time and sort of figuring out some things you can do ahead of time to make it easier. But we're all like that. Uh, well, it's out of sight, out of mind. Um, and so we need to be able to both document where we need to have some tweaks and fixes, but also if you have suggestions, because again, you're the best people. You're on the front lines. You understand how it impacts you, it impacts your lives, it impacts your loved ones. And I would bet that you've got some really great ideas on how, could, how it could be improved. And so looking for those opportunities um, to say, okay, you know, we, we, we know what your goal is, what you're trying to do, but maybe if we sort of did it this way, we could actually get there. Um, I was using earlier an example. Um, my dad's right now in a skilled nursing facility um, with a broken leg. <coughs> oh, 
but he has bad arthritis and his ankles don't work real well. And they were, she kept trying to get him up into his wheelchair so he could then go to therapy. And the way they were doing it was painful. And he's like, no, no, I, I can't do it. I won't do it. And I'm like, and I'm not there because he's up in Reno. I'm like, you've got to be compliant. We got to, you know, you've got to be able to walk so I can get you released. <coughs> so finally one day he thought about it and he said, well, you know what? If you move me this way, I can get into the wheelchair easier and it won't hurt. And they kind of looked at him and they went, really? And they did it. And so ever since then, he's been compliant. He's doing his walking. He's getting in his wheelchair. He's doing what they want, and he's, he's, at, he's getting better. But it took somebody to say, wait a minute, this isn't working. What's a better way? You all know what that better way is. So as you see that, um, and, if, and if you feel like you can't do it on your own, you've got great advocates with CFRI. Um, you've got advocates at the Children's Hospital. You've got advocates in the CCS program. Let us know. <coughs> You've got advocates in family resource centers and programs like uh, Family Voices because together all of our voices can make a difference. Um, and I think it's really important because if we don't do that, the CCS program as we know it today will be folded into Medi-Cal Managed Care. Affordable Care Act will continue to focus on the healthy who need um, regular preventative health care and not necessarily those with with chronic health care conditions so it's up to all of us to start making some of those recommendations and I've probably left more time than you thought for questions but I really like responding to the questions all of you have the best yes Sixteen, you will no longer be able to get GHPP. Well, GHPP actually rolled into um, Medi-Cal Managed Care last year as part of the. Well, I'm sure you sure can. So he's. I didn't know about it for a whole year. And <laughs> yeah, I don't know what to say because we don't get any benefits from Medi-Cal because we have insurance. Right. So I. Don't know. So uh, the first thing I would suggest to you is, I don't know who, where you live, but go talk to your state senator, go talk to your state assembly member, let them in on this, tell them what the, ask them to intervene on your behalf, seriously. Um, they have, all of the ones locally in this valley have health care staff, and that's part of what they do, is trying to make everything work. So GHPP was actually they didn't think of it as part of CCS and had it carved out because there was never any formal carve out for GHPP like there was for CCS. So when they did the, the transition of seniors and persons with disabilities, they just went down and picked aid codes that fit those categories and moved them over. And they were supposed to notify people ahead of time. They were supposed to give you some opportunities for choice. And we're hearing this more and more, that that did not occur. So I wish I could say this was a unique situation, but it's not. Thank you, <laughs> So not you're not alone. But that's, wh that's, why, that's why I'm encouraging you to talk to your, your local legislator, because they can't fix this if they don't hear about it. And if all they're reading are some stories in the newspaper, they're thinking, oh, that's an, that's an issue, but when it's but it may not be anybody in my area that's impacted. But when they start hearing that it's people who live in their area, they'll get involved in And we actually have some very responsive and responsible legislators in this area. And I'm happy afterwards to, if you tell me where you live, to tell you who your legislators are. Um, for those that just got a renewal for GHPP for this year until next year, does that mean you're still under GHPP if you fill it out, send it back, you send your check. They can't change it, or they they they, they, they should it. not be able to change it in the middle. Okay. And if they try to, they should have to give you notice. But again, you can, you can. There's some appeals and pushbacks you can do. Okay. So then, 
next year, May 2015, that's probably when they'll start kicking it over between January of 2016. They, they, they may try, but we'll see what we can get done in the next year. Um, but it doesn't look promising. <laughs> it sounds like G Well, GHPD it doesn't will look be. promising except maybe I am Pollyanna, and I admit it. Um, I, I'm an eternal optimist, and I actually believe that um, people organized and banded together can change the world. Um, the example I'm going to use is years ago when I worked for the state legislature, when I worked for a member of the state legislature. It was another bad budget year, and so they were going to make incredible cuts to um, the developmentally disabled community. And they organized in like a week and had bus loads and bus loads of people descending on the Capitol, but also calling legislators in their district offices. And somehow they found another way to do that. They were all united around one issue. Um, those of us um, in the sort of the CCSGA, we have all we have all sorts of issues, and so we've never gotten quite that organized. And um, I'm going to do a little anecdote. We were Family Voices, which works with a lot of kids who have um, some are D have DDs and some are other chronic issues and all sorts of things. Um, and they were having their annual Legislative Day conference up in Sacramento. Just happened. I mean, this was coincidental because the conference had been scheduled for months, is that the state assembly, the budget health subcommittee, decided to do their first overview of the upcoming budget hearing. And the staffer, who's just dynamite, heard that there were a lot of CCS interested folks in town and added CCS to the oversight hearing. And these families came over and said, here's my child, here's what we're doing, Here's why the CCS program is so important to them. I'm really worried about this, you know, that the carve out is going to go away, especially since we haven't had any pilots. We don't know what else, uh, the alternatives. And the legislature basically said to the state, the legislators there at the hearing said, we want to report back on why there hasn't been, the pilots haven't been implemented, and what your plan is. And then we'd hear people afterwards saying, we don't really want all these families coming up here because nobody can resist families and kids. Um, and so that's sort of in the back pocket. And so it's like, well, we won't descend, but you need to work with us because there's got to be a better way. Are you no, it's just in California. Okay. Just in California. This is California's. Um, it, it's really funny. So I'm, I'm going to digress a little bit, but I think it ties back. Children's hospitals, those that are like Packard that are considered independent and that they're just focusing on children, or in our case, children and expectant moms, started organ we've been organizing on a national level on a number of issues for years, but about three years ago, 10 of us got together and said, you know, we're really dependent on Medicaid programs, um, and as we go to Medica Medicaid managed care, on average, children's hospitals, 50% of their patient population are covered by Medicaid. We're on the low side at Packard. We're only 43%. But it's, and we cross state lines because we get patients from all over. And it's like, if we don't do something to make sure we're here for all kids, we're not going to be here for any kids. So we've got to be here for the Medi-Cal, Medicaid kids. And so we started with 10 of us. We're now up to 60 plus children's hospitals. And we're working on a national proposal that there's some irony here because it looks a little bit like what we've had in California with the CCS to say maybe we need to have these regional networks if what the federal government cares most about is reducing the cost of care and reducing health care costs. Rather than you just coming and saying we're cutting everybody and we're cutting Medicaid by 10 percent and we're cutting disproportionate share, why don't you tell us what your goal is and let us actually help to design a system. We know the most expensive piece of healthcare for children with chronic and catastrophic healthcare conditions is hospitalization. But we don't have any control over physician providers and community clinics and, and when kids get transferred to us and when we get So if you let us have a little bit more control, create this federal network that's um, anchored by children's hospitals, we'll be willing to go at risk we think we could reduce the growth rate and 
from our perspective, even more importantly, improve the health care outcomes of children. And so we're working on trying to do that on the federal level. And the criteria and the standards and things that we're looking at are a lot of what we have in the CCS program. And it's like, okay, in California, we're trying to get rid of the CCS program. And on the federal level, we're trying to do something. And so I'm hopeful that we'll, that we'll be able to do something. Because for all of us, the bottom line is how do we get kids into the right to the right care at the right time with the right provider. Um, and if I were an adult physician, adult hospital, I'd probably want to say the same thing, but I focus on kids. So it's about getting, because we know the difference it makes when you get that child to the right place at the right time. Just like we know the difference it's made that we can now diagnose CF at birth and, and do preventative and, you know, and hopefully by the time my nieces and nephew are grown up, we won't have any late diagnosis of CF, and a CF patient will have the same lifespan as anybody else. Um, that's, that's my vision. Is there some way that you can bring them to the restroom like you are with children? Um, there is a counterpart that does government relations and community relations at the adult hospital. I'm not sure if he gets as involved in some of these specific issues as I do. Um, so, and, and that's not any disrespect to him or the adult facility. It's something that's more uniquely children's hospitals. Um, because my counterparts in children's hospitals all over the country do. Um, but, and I would also add that children's hospitals probably had dedicated government relations staff a lot longer than adult facilities. Adult systems have had them, but individual. Um, so they're still, they're still uh, growing pains there. And I think they're doing some good job work. They just haven't quite done that piece. Okay, do we have other questions? Yes, we have a, a few um, questions from our, our online community. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, with new providers, it, you know, it really has to do with, like, really looking at care for, you know, someone who knows what they're doing uh, for someone with chronic illness or CF. So um, with that in mind, um, if someone is looking, you know, for insurance, um, how, what would you recommend in terms of uh, finding a provider that will provide the best care for an individual with CF? I wish there were an easy answer to that question. Um, part, of, part of the problem was the original directory that came out in California, and I've heard is similar um, in other states. Um, it, it was really incomplete. So I, I think I would probably start with if talking to, if you already have a provider in the pediatric world, talking to them. You know, who are their recommendations? Who in the adult world? Um, I know that, that um, our adult hospital, Stanford, has a CF clinic, but it took a while um, for that to get developed in and was done a lot in partnership with us. Um, we're doing the same thing right now with adult congenital heart defects because heart defects are really, congenital heart defects are really a child, but now, again, good news, folks are living to adulthood, so we're helping to train them. So I would actually ask for recommendations from pediatric pulmonologists and CF specialists, and then go online in terms of the directories and see where those adult providers are and which um, plans they're included in. It's a, lot of, it, it's a lot of work, I know, but that's the only way I would know to, to be able to actually have a sense of who's out there. And there may be, you know, and I'd also look at who's graduating um, from their residencies and their pulmonar pulmonology and CF residencies. Because um, some of those young docs are absolutely incredible. Um, an individual uh, did her research and she found uh, what she thought to be um, good individual and a good individual plan. Uh, it turned out when she uh, went uh, to receive care, 
the particular hospital told her that her individual plan wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to accept it. So in that case, would she go to GHPP or what would you recommend in terms of her uh, trying to figure out how to get out of her specific the, the problem? The first step I would do is, is contact Covered California um, and say, we did this new plan. Um, online it said, you know, when we signed up that this hospital was a participant, we went to try. Um, this is the hospital we need for our specialized care. It's now out of network. We need your help to be able to change plans. Um, another individual said um, he may be moving out of his state. Mm -hmm. um, wh where is the pl best place to go to find uh, programs comparable to, um, I guess, GHPP or even CCS um, if you're not in California? That's a really good question because most states don't have um, either of those programs. Um, I think what I would do again is talk to your current physician because most of the specialists in both GHPP and CF belong to national organizations um, and I would say to them, I'm moving out of state, this is where I'm moving, who do you know in this state that I can talk to and that they can then help hook me up with the right people in that state. But I would do it physician to physician. Um, and if that didn't work, I would, I would look at, um, that's, I, I, hmm. I might call one of the, the national health plans, like a Blue Cross Blue Shield, H, um, Kaiser and say, we're moving to another state. Um, do you have recommendations on where we can get started? But I think I would, I would definitely start first with the physician to physician, because I know our physicians work closely. One of the nice things about both the GHPP world and the, and the pediatric world is that um, it's pretty small, and the doctors all know one another, and so I would, I would start with the current providers and asking them, who they know, and it might be, you know, recommendation down, you know, sort of two levels. But my guess is they could probably at least know somebody who knows somebody that can get help get you started. Thank you. Um, we have another question from an online um, viewer. Um, I'm a, I am confused about who is being moved from GHPP to Medi-Cal. Everyone. I just got my renewal application request from GHPP and sent it in. Well, she, the, that, that um, online viewer is not the only one confused um, because they didn't, it wasn't just sort of across the board, they went different aid codes. So it depended on what your aid code was, whether it was an automatic transfer. And then they've gone back now because of some of the issues and they've looked at them. So if you got your renewal, I'd send it in. And if they, again, if something happens in the middle, call your legislator um, because it's a state program. Um, if it wasn't a state program, it'd be a different issue, it, but it's a state program. So I, and I'd get them to intervene if, if they're starting to change it on you. And, and I have to, sometimes people would say, oh, I can't call my state legislator. I worked for 15 years as legislative staff, federal, state, local level. As staff, that's part of our job to act on your behalf, to intervene when um, an agency wasn't doing exact what they were supposed to be doing. You know, and sometimes we might come back to you and say, you know, th this piece is the piece you need to do and you haven't done it, but, but oftentimes it was a glitch on the agency and once you brought it to their attention, they fixed it, but I mean, I, I have that problem still as people say, oh no, if we, if we call the state, they'll put us at the bottom of the list. They can't do that. They can't retaliate that way. Um, and th I mean, the legislators have staff and this is a good part of what they do. If you already have 
uh, Medicare, then what happens? Do you get Medicare and whatever insurance is available? If, if you already have Medicare, so over 65, um, if you're already on Medicare, you shouldn't have to, you could stay on Medicare. You should not have to change. Um, the only thing we've done in California is those that were duly eligible who were low income um, are eligible for Medi-Cal as well as Medicare. And the Medi-Cal portion um, actually covered the, the premium for the, for the Medicare program. But if you are on Medicare, you can't be on California covered. That is correct. Okay. Um, and if and you can't if you're on Medicare and you're over 65, even, you even under. Yeah, yeah, Medicare, and you, yeah, you can't. You can't be on the health exchange. You can't be on covered California. If you're on disability, you have to have Medicare. If you have that, you can't have covered California. That that's that is correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So okay. You so you're okay. So there's issues in terms of the Medicare program isn't covering what. The pieces, well, some we of the still have insurance, so nobody will wants anything to do with us. But we can't cancel insurance. They tell us, and yet, so we have no. Okay, then. Um, Good insurance. Thank you. Right, I'm right. Not complaining. No, 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 no. I, it's a high premium. Um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I know some on Medicare and Medicaid. I know zero on Medicare. Um, only what I'm having to learn because I have a a, a dad who's 86. Um, so I don't know, I, other than I know that if you're on Medicare, you can't do covered California. So again, what I'm going to suggest, if you're local, call Congresswoman Anna Eshoo's office. Her staff is outstanding. Um, and this is an issue that, that they'll look into for you. Um, they're, they're, they're very good. Who is that? Con are you local here? Daly City. Daly City. Yeah, you've got Congresswoman Jackie Spear. Okay. Also outstanding. Um, and with both of these congresswomen, they care about health care issues. Um, they, they will be very, um, Congresswoman Spear and her staff will be very interested. So um, please do call them because they may not know that there's this glitch um, and so they need, to, they need to, to know about it. So please do call them. Oh, you're welcome. I have one more online question. Um, just he he wants clarification about what carve out means. Ah, good question. Um, when the state enacted uh, Medi-Cal managed care back in 1994, uh, people who had children who were covered by CCS said, "This really worries us. We don't know how this will work." And the state agreed. And at that that point. Um, now I'm going to forget whether she was an assemblywoman still or she had already moved to the state senate. But Marion Ferguson said that makes sense, and so she wrote language that said um, children and um, and, uh, and teens who are covered by the CCS program, the, the CCS provided services are not included in the Medi-Cal managed care plan, and are still paid by the state in the state fee for service program. So it is carved out. It's not a part of the Medi-Cal managed care plan. And so for 20 years, they've been trying to test whether or not they can move this population into Medi-Cal managed care, but have yet to complete a pilot. Thank you all very much. Oh, uh-huh. The transcript is something we can listen to um, for the speech today? That's a question for David. David, can we get, uh, no, I forget things. Yeah, we will have this online and archived, okay, so you'll be able to pick it up. Can I just say, the person that asked about finding a doctor or something, would the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation be a help to them? Probably. That's a good suggestion. That's, and, you know, and, and CFRI could probably be a help as well. Absolutely. And but with Cystic Fibrosis Foundation being national, absolutely. That's a good suggestion. Thank you all very much. I really appreciate your time and attention. Well, thank you very much for the uh, truly informative talk, uh, Sherry. And um, you know, we we know that uh, CF living with CF is really challenging, and 
tonight we basically heard uh, what our options can be as individuals and families with CF and the Affordable Care Act. Um, we have learned, what we have learned is uh, certainly invaluable and we wanna thank you very much uh, for sharing uh, everything that you have. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you all again for being here and for, our, uh, for being here at our April CF Discovery Series. Um, and uh, a special thanks once more for Genentech, uh, Cor Cornerstone Therapeutics, and Modern Health uh, Pharmacy for sponsoring tonight's CF Discovery Series. Um, if we can find our evaluation sheets, uh, would you complete the uh, evaluations before you leave tonight? Uh, I'd like to also remind you that uh, we have uh, Jeff Wine speaking to us at our uh, CFRI general membership meeting on May the 28th. Uh, that will hopefully be also uh, streamed online. And uh, from all of us uh, at CFRI, we will see you at our next Discovery Series on September 9th here in the Crown Plaza, Cabana, and CFRI Live. So thank you and good night. <laughs>